Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Hi, I'm glad to welcome you here this morning. Uh, my name is Maria Gillen, and I'm director of the Poetry Center here at Passaic County Community College and of the Distinguished Poets series. Um, today, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Diane Wachowski uh, as our featured poet. And uh, Diane has a new book out called Emerald Ice, Selected Poems, 1962 to 1987, and is published by Black Sparrow Press. Um, unfortunately, her books did not arrive, so I would say to you that if you would like to buy one of her books, uh, that uh, you can just give her the money and she'll have her publisher mail you the book. Um, this is the second time that Diane Wachowski has been um, at in this reading series. Uh, she was here for us about maybe five years ago. And uh, I was so pleased by um, the reaction of the audience to Diane and uh, by the kind of the genuine um, feeling that comes across in her poetry uh, by the intelligence and the passion that she manages to weave into it, that I decided I was going to have Diane come back uh, again uh, for, my, for our audience. And I thought there was a very interesting um, statement about her work, uh, which was published recently. And uh, it said, hers is a crafty sensibility in which the chill of wine and strawberries mix, mixes with a daunting self-criticism. And I think, I remember hearing Diane read at the Geraldine Dodge Festival and thinking that, that poetry is a mixture of the ability to use language uh, in, in a beautiful way and the ability to be totally honest and take great risks. And I think that that's what Diane Wachowski does in her poetry. Um, let's welcome Diane Wachowski. I'm going to be reading almost entirely from uh, new work or, or recent work. I've, I've for several years now been um, thinking about a poem of the West because I come from Southern California and even though I lived in New York for 15 years and now I've lived in the Midwest for 15 years, uh, I think of myself as a Westerner, both as Western America and Western in the sense of Western civilization. And like everybody else in the world right now, I seem to be wanting to write an epic poem. Uh, but um, uh, I don't know how epic my life can be. And uh, um, so we'll see what happens with that. There are several focuses. I finished the first collection, which will be published this fall of this uh, big work, um, which is my general title for it is The Archaeology of Movies and Books. And my feeling is that I'm trying to dig down into uh, my roots or the roots of my civilization and myself. Um, and certainly my own history comes out of movies and books as much as anything else. The first volume, which will be published this fall, is called Medea the Sorceress because I've taken the story of Medea all my life as a story of myself in some way. I've tried to use ideas from quantum theory about uh, the possibilities of the universe in constructing this work. And another one of the ongoing metaphors that I use, which I see as tied in to um, particle and wave theory and light and so forth, is um, the image of photography. My husband is a photographer and I think a lot about photography and as a result of just simply being exposed to his work and workings. And uh, so 
Does anybody want a seat while? Um, okay, thanks. Sure. I don't want to walk in front of the camera either. This first poem is called Coiling Light. 1953, I suppose. Orange County. He's knocking on my door, smelling of middle class aftershave. A rich kid, a lawyer's son with orthodonture and his own swimming pool tan. Smart, with bad grades. A smart ass in school. We were so different. But we both had thick glasses and read lots of books, played chess, and it turned out we're obsessed with sex. Weren't all teenagers? I don't know. Not one word about my sex life passed my lips, nor did I ever hear another girl talk of it until I was nearly middle-aged. And of course now, I only speak about sex of the distant Orange County past. Leap. I want to leap off the diving board into that swimming pool, and I want to swim beyond my fear of water and my need for sex. I want to dive into an ocean of stories that start with a coyote singing in the La Habra Heights, the land of rich kids. In the hills above my house, I want to forget the twin brother I invented and the father of my country who never spoke up for me when the prizes of this country were given out. <laughs> What I want to do is turn into the moon who is mapped with mares or oceans and to be the silvery body of light in which all men can swim. I want to be the water and the swimmer. I want to be the moon, the girl with the silver ankle who disappears just as you were trying to grasp her foot. Moon, moon, cried the one-eyed poet. When you leave me, I am alone. But the moon never leaves the lover, the poet. She is there quiet as light. I want to be more than I was meant to be. Light, light. Can anyone want as much as I have wanted? I draw the light, I collect it. I pull it toward me, it coils around my head and shoulders until any man who looks at me will see its writhing shapes be mesmerized, frozen in its diamondback heat. Well, one of my muses, probably the best way to say that, one of my muses, is Robert Creeley, and he's the one-eyed poet that I often refer to in these poems. Um, and what I was quoting is uh, his poem, A Form of Women, and there's another poem of his that is a kind of muse or musing for me, a meditation. It's a poem called Kore, uh, using the Persephone myth. Um, and it ends with those wonderful lines, Oh love, where are you leading me now? And that's sort of the theme of this work for me. This next poem is called Medea, the Sorceress. I know you all know the story of Medea, who is the magician that uh, Jason turns to when he has to uh, get the golden fleece, and that um, she is willing to make great sacrifices because she falls in love with Jason, and she helps him, and then he marries her. They have children, but as soon as he needs help from somebody else, um, he abandons Medea and marries the other woman, the heir to the new kingdom. And, of course, the great drama of Medea is that in her rage and anger, and in spite of her powers as a sorceress, she hasn't been able to prevent herself from loving Jason or preventing Jason from betraying her. She kills the false bride and murders her children and Jason. And in most versions of the story, she escapes because she is in some way not... What her role is, is to destroy the falseness. And she escapes through her magic and goes to Athens and begins another life. Um, for us, this is an almost incomprehensible drama of sacrifice and... Um, 
of values that we, we have a hard time with in our culture. Medea the Sorceress. She is in the home for unwed mothers in Pasadena, the only girl who reads poetry. He writes to her from his prep school and she memorizes the sonnets of Shakespeare as she takes her exercise on the dusty, scrubby grounds of the home. No enchantment changes her life. She is told by the social worker that she has failed because she still loves Jay. She doesn't regret doing anything for love. She doesn't believe she is bad. She doesn't regret giving up her child. She believes her life will go on the same as it has always gone on, and she won't talk about her mistakes. This is the same as being on the desert, this life in the linoleum-floored room, eating with girls who have been raped by their fathers, and girls who got caught but didn't know with what man, and girls who were only 13 and girls who were nurses sleeping with doctors, and girls who wanted to forget everything and join the army, girls who were all pregnant and ashamed and who knew they were wandering some desert, though most of them, most of us, didn't know the name of desert rattlers or moths like the dusty silver wing or about the tiny burrowing owls or the lingering scent of sagebrush when the night was pure, pure, as we knew we still were. So as if she were Medusa, excuse me, so as if she were Medea, when the letters came talking casually about his dates with other girls, unpregnant girls, she decided that she would have no choice. She would kill him and her children and like the sorceress, leave for another world in her chariot drawn by dragons. She gave up her baby. No regrets. Only the weak have regrets. She went to Berkeley and she told him to go away. No regrets. Only the weak have regrets. She flew in her chariot with all her dragon lady power to Berkeley then New York, then the Midwest, and finally to this cafe where she sits telling the tale not of the tribe, but of herself, and in spite of what others say, she knows that the song the silvery moon-questing lady of dragonlight sings is the tale for at least half of the tribe. Strum, gunslinger. Hail, Maximus. Ascent is descent, Dr. Patterson. O oh, love, one-eyed poet, where are you leading me now? No one should be at the home for unwed mothers. That is the real wasteland. These epistles, not cantos or songs, will be for Craig, knight of hummingbird light, for Jonathan, who understands the myth of the woman sleeping in flame, and for Steelman, my husband, who loves me at night in his invisible cap of darkness. And for all women, the other half of the tribe, for Eve who dared to eat this apple, I write this letter and sign myself Diane, the Lady of Light. I'm very interested in how often uh, people in uh, studying mythology confused the name Medea and Medusa. And of course, uh, feminist studies will tell you that Medusa is one of the earliest figures of female worship. And uh, originally, she's just a symbol of great, great power and awe. But we have transformed her into this evil witch-like figure. And they are an interesting, interchangeable uh, group. This poem, if, if you'd like to find a seat, but wouldn't bother me at all. <laughs> yeah, why don't you just move that? This poem is called Western Birds. <laughs> what? 
No one is with me. Driving the highway into spare Wyoming in this car, which holds me impersonally the way a movie star holds another actor and makes me think of how I look behind the wheel, a woman in her late thirties, tanned and gleaming with American beef and fresh vegetables. I wear short driving gloves, bits of pigskin with their little pucks of elegant snaps at the wrist and my arms are slim, suspended like fuchsia stamen over the wheel of my brown Audi. What bad eyes see is silhouettes, and we have memorized details to go with those shapes which are radiantly acute. So though it seems improbable that with my thick, disguising aviator glasses, I do notice the hawks that sit on telephone poles or the staves of prairie fence. I do see the rivulets on breast or the fan of red tail. I do remark the shape or pattern of crow or raven in contrast to vulture, eagle, or hawk. The road leads me like a rattlesnake curving in rhythmic undulations, the hiss of my tires singing me away from apple trees and cherries to Yellowstone and Buffalo, to geysers, to the Tetons that only look like decorations. I never forget there was a Jason. I never forget fleeing from California and the West beyond snake worship to the magic language of riddles and spells. I know that I left the garden of Orange County with only three of those golden fruit in my wallet. And when I return to Las Vegas, I pull and pull the handles of machines trying to line up cherries or oranges or plums whenever I can. I tell you though, no sorcery will save you from the major rules. And if it seems to, then you have only misread them, misheard them. Aeneas is supposed to return, golden bough or not, and Medea to escape despite fratricide, infanticide. Stories cannot be compared quantitatively. No fairness ever if you compare how much or how long or who gets what. The rules are about the patterns the stories, completing the cycles or rhythms. As any gambler can tell you, if you bet on either pattern, patterns or randomness, you lose. What you have to observe is completion. And usually not enough, not a big enough sample is possible ever to see it. So you are radiant when you win and silent when you don't. You never lose sight of something diurnal, a rhythm perhaps, or a story. Following this road in Wyoming, which is empty of everything but my car and the hawks on the fence posts, is the quest. Not even dreaming yet, there are other seekers on this empty road. This is a jump to my neighborhood in East Lansing. Oh, I thought it was. <laughs> I'll go back to California. This poem is called California Girl. <laughs> that wasn't really a phrase when I was growing up, actually. <laughs> and of course, Valley Girl didn't yet exist because the valley was sort of still nothing. But. Uh, it's a term that's come to haunt me as I uh, age in the Midwest. If I had the ankles of Belma Basket, thin-boned like china, made to be clung to by a discreet gold chain and barely covered by long black stockings, I'd wear ice-pick-heeled sandals and skirts rather than jeans so that my thoroughbred ankles would always show. And if I had better posture and, more important, a good sense of balance, I suppose I might even with my thick ankles have chosen expensive British or Italian leather pumps with medium heels and business-like assurance. But all my life, I, 
I, who could look at shoes and see their beauty with the same attention and interest that serious art lovers spend with the Chicago Art Institute's Monet's or the Metropolitan's Rembrandt's, have had one unsuccessful pair of shoes after another. <laughs> <laughs> Settling finally for a decade of Chinese communist cloth Mary Janes, which I now really, I now realize nearly destroyed my feet as I walked for hours without support on city streets. Boots, I've liked boots, molded to make my ankles look as if they have a carved shape or stout bass or fries, which make it seem as if I'm modestly not revealing that I have Ginger Rogers' exquisite instep and ankle. <laughs> Sneakers and work shoes, I have had them too. And in those times begun to accept what I'll never be. Shall I start over here and tell you about the California girl who was required to be in gym classes, always the last girl chosen on any team, always a failure, whether it was team sports, the softball she couldn't throw, or individual sports, the tennis ball which seemed to be worse than a bullet. Easy to despise those dykish girls who were the captains of the teams, but not so easy to handle the pretty ones with 20 cashmere sweaters, perfectly whited saddle shoes, curled hair, the ones who flipped perfectly in gymnastics and on trampolines, who hit the ball and threw it well every game, who danced in modern dance classes if they were training for Broadway, and who, of course, became cheerleaders. I didn't even go to football games until my senior year when I occasionally accompanied my boyfriend, the photographer for the school paper. And I certainly knew that if I didn't, that if it didn't take brains or anything interesting to be a cheerleader, but they were always, always on the edge of my mind. Always there. This is what California is about. This is what American culture is about. We invented cheerleaders, along with the automobiles, supermarkets, and blue jeans. What was wrong with me that I didn't know this or care? The answer, of course, is that I did. But I also didn't learn to drive a car until I was 32. I didn't wear blue jeans, now my common garb, until I was 35. And I didn't discover how much I loved supermarkets until, also in my 30s, I went to Europe and found myself longing for them. So why should I be surprised now, aged 50, having finally converted to the only comfortable, healthy, and fashionable shoes I have ever had, my Kaipa aerobic shoes, which though I do no exercise at all, I wear for everything, <laughs> trying on a new pair, finding that the model I wore through four pairs had been discontinued, that those first good, comfortable shoes, healthy ones, California girl ones, were designed for cheerleaders? Cheerleader shoes notched at the instep for standing on spirited shoulders. That's what I wore to enter my 50s. Oh, origins, oh, California American girl, you cannot escape your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose what magic is really about is trying to escape your destiny. And it's always interesting to me that in all the archetypal stories, the magician basically can never change destiny. Um, this is called When Breakfast is Brought by the Morning Star. When breakfast is brought by the morning star, she is imagining that she is writing a book with white pages and that her coffee, which comes in a thin cup, will taste like raspberries. She has been a lily all night, on a pond, and her white petals fold into a cone as she sees the morning star who delivers the Wall Street Journal folded on the tray with the china cup and the silver pot. Water lilies, she thinks, but she doesn't write it down. And morning glories, the book is open on her lap. Her thick satin nightgown is folded around her. Raspberries with cream would be nice. Her husband is sleeping, and on the pillow his gardener's face, tanned and earthy, moves slightly with his morning breath. He and she dream different things, 
but both wake up against petals. Both drink a clear glass of water. Both descend the stairs and find the morning star has brought their steaming cups, the fruit, the grain. Sometimes I miss the obvious, but often the water lilies break open in the sunlight and the pond poses for Monet. And when I stand still, I notice all the mistakes I have made. I notice also that I could live forever and never live my life differently. I still long for all the things which seemed so elusive and which I made so many mistakes trying to find. When I wake up in the morning, there is for a moment the sense that everything is possible, that I can rewrite my life, that I can be a different woman. But then the morning star serves breakfast, and one sip, whether it be a dark, fragrant tea or a rich, oily cup of dark beaned coffee, one sip, and I know that my life is the same one I've always lived. New day. New day doesn't mean new life. It means that you continue to work out newly each day the story you were always destined to tell. This is a poem for my friend Judith Minty, a, a wonderful earth poet of Michigan who now lives in Northern California. And uh, one of whose daughters uh, graduated a few years ago from the CIA, I mean by that, the Culinary Institute of America, <laughs> and uh, is now a chef in Santa Fe. And uh, Judith wrote to me about her daughter coming to San Francisco and she and her daughter traveling around trying interesting restaurants. And of course, uh, I, I don't think that her daughter would have been inspired to become a chef if she hadn't grown up with a mother who was a pretty good cook herself. So. This poem is called Our Lady of the Chanterelles. And you probably know chanterelles are a wild mushroom, a very beautiful, twisting mushroom, and they grow in Northern California in abundance, much like the morels do in Michigan. I love knowing that when a person opens her hand, there is a map there, if only you know what to look for, how to read it. Looking into your American hand, Judith, I see that you have learned San Francisco and inscri inscribed its arcing bridges as rings on all your fingers, left the mitten of Michigan behind. You're driving your daughter, the chef, over the Golden Gate into Marin County on your way to white tablecloths and daily rues, drinking those nectary chardonnays and wondering about how much more at home you feel in Northern California with baskets of chanterelles and hedgehogs rather than the wrinkly, brainy morels of your own state. I could say the map was too unevolved here in Michigan, though there is no Pacific Ocean with its primal, salty broth to remind me of what is not beyond the oak trees in my backyard. The map of this state is a mitten, a throwback to the first opposable thumbs, no dexterous, articulated fingers to accompany them. No chef's hand so skillfully trained as Annie's. No eye for beauty like the one that she gets from you. I've always thought it's kind of dumb to say that the eyes are the windows of the soul. I actually judge people by their hands. But my husband, Steel Man, who photographs people's eyes unflinchingly, won his second Nikon in a contest called The Eyes of Laura Mars. In the dappled light of the Ala Moana shopping mall in Honolulu, he offered his photo of your daughter, Judith, who was then a teenager, a newly converted vegetarian who cooked all of her own food separately from the rest of the family. In the portrait, her eyes looked right at you. You, then, the inventive cook, the chef selecting mercilessly the most perfect eggplant, a smooth-skinned royal bulb, the sweetest onion and three tomatoes whose skins would curl away for taut ripeness. Like Laura Mars, 
The fashion photographer who saw something in women, that one, excuse me, like Laura Mars, the fashion photographer who saw something in women that one man longed to slash out, Annie looks from the photo slightly amused at perfect surfaces and subtle blemishes. The photographer seems to know that eyes do not record surfaces only, and the eyes of his portrait subjects, they seem always to be cutting away and cutting away at onion-like layers of surfacing. The deep reality, the core, is light itself, and one feels especially in his women, the Sibyls, the Delphic oracle priestesses, or Martian women, that they are reading the future because they are molding it. With their eyes, they tell you this soft lavender bell will become the shiny eggplant, and this yellow star the tomato. Under the juicy green spike is the ball with its crackling envelope like an airmail letter, and my hands someday will skin these vegetables long after these eyes did it originally. When you think you are looking into someone's eyes, what is really happening is that they are pushing you back into your own core where you recognize a message which is always the same at the root light. Everything is made of light. You only imagine there are windows and their hands, mother and daughter traveling in mushroom light. What do they really map or touching see? In the light of chanterelles that twist and crown you, Judith, in western light, glinting from the sharpest knife in the kitchen, in map light and in kitchen light, I see Our Lady who leads us to the center, Our Lady of Chanterelles, Our Lady of Light. Well, here's the poem that moves back to my Michigan neighborhood. It's called Neighborhood Light. Um, we got new... Uh, lights installed on our street last year. All the men hate them, all the women love them. They're very bright. Ours shines in the... And um, they, we live in a, a na neighborhood that has historic concerns, so it, it took about five years to get these lights installed because everyone fussed over whether they were properly historic-looking lights. Um, and they're an interesting combination of the old and the new. I, I love them. Robert hates them. So. <laughs> Neighborhood light. The fat woman whose husband beats her and who lives down the block from us lives in darkness much of the time. Now our board of water and light is installing new lamps in front of our houses and she stands there in the yard where her purple crocuses are covered with a thin film of snow and watches the hard-hatted men get ready to bring light to our small neighborhood. But she, like Persephone at this time of year, isn't quite out of the darkness yet. No April light in her tightly shuttered house, whose small wooden squareness must squeeze her huge hips and leave them more bruised than her husband does. I see her standing there on the handkerchief lawn, looking puzzled at the lights, the globes, the workmen. She isn't Persephone. Light and dark are the same to her. She is the mother of two very young children who visibly have different fathers. No mother ever pulled her back from the dark underground of her fat lady life, and no lover like Orpheus ever thought to rush down after her and kiss her out of viper sleep. The myth of women with their healing powers and their gifts for regeneration, she has been sheathed against it. She's not a woman locked down in her dark little house. She is, what is she? She has hidden her sex in fat. She lives puzzled by light. She has children to serve her. She chooses a bad husband, one who could not find a woman. She is a disguise. Don't pity her. Pity her children and pity the child in her who also never knew a woman a woman for mother, pity the long line of such impure products. I turn away, 
I turn away. One rescues because of overwhelming love. I do not have it. I could not go down underground for her, having already stumbled blindly and raggedly through my own winter, to only just now see the April light flooding through my house. Never would I have the strength to go down in darkness again. Never have the strength twice to bring myself back out of the dark. They moved away because they're slumlords. No, you have eight students living in that house. <laughs> I've gotten very interested in teenage movies, I suppose. Anyone who grows up in Southern California has is stuck. I don't know. Um, any rate, this poem refers to movie stars, I don't know whether that means anything or not. It's called Men's Eyes. When there is something in the air which makes you turn around, which makes you think someone is watching you and no one is there, you think of all the movies you have seen and loved, the men you'd like to have following you or waiting for you as you tap tap along the street on your way home. In my living room was a motorcycle and the man in black leathers who once rode it waiting in the dark, smoking a lucky strike, reading William's poems from memory. Behind the door of the bedroom was the secret of his departure, a ticket to another place, and I only imagined him sitting there smoking, waiting for me to unlock the door. One of the things successful movie stars always have is a way of using their eyes. It draws the camera to them. You, the camera, are always drawn to their eyes. John Cusack has beautiful eyes fringed with lashes that make you want to be held and cuddled by him, as if you were an animal and he a loving animal owner. Tom Cruise's eyes always seem to be looking seriously at the world and slightly making fun of it drawing you into the secret of what he sees. He knows how to use them so that you feel as if he is including you, the viewer. Patrick Swayze has hawk eyes like Glenn Scott and Clint Eastwood. Excuse me, Scott Glenn and Clint Eastwood. They seem to be tough surveillance eyes, steely and never sharing anything. They seem intact, inviolable and infinitely courageous. You want to possess such men because you know they are unavailable. You, the viewer, are drawn into them knowing that they will lead you interesting places even though you could never really be a part of the adventure. The man in the darkened living room, unlike the King of Spain who is that secret follower, has eyes like Tom Cruise. He seems to be saying, share my secret. It is the absurd universe. But when I unlock the door, he is not there. The whole apartment is empty. If I were in the movies, there would be someone watching me as I tap down the city street. But in my life, it could only be the King of Spain. No man in motorcycle leather sits waiting for me. And the steely hawk eyes I look into and myself follow belong to my husband, the man for whom I barter everything just for a touch. <clears throat> and this poem is called Mint Flowers. The crush of lavender this summer, the lushness of everything, even the modest flowers tipping each stalk of mint, crowds into the morning and more like liatris or loose strife. They hover by the side of the house in Michigan next to the climbing wild rose. Who would think of bouquets of mint flowers? This is also the summer of mosquitoes, nets of them appearing before your face, gloves of them covering your hands, and this is the summer when weeding no longer seems interesting to me. No, I mean it. I used to love weeding. It was such a way of ordering the world. 
Your lover wouldn't make love to you. Or you never got promoted in your professional life. Or your husband was constantly falling apart. Or your car breaking down. Always too much to do. Always too much to do. And then you go out in the garden, get down on your hands and knees, and you fill large bags with weeds and weeds and weeds. And each bit of ground becomes clean. Each planted plant breathes with its new space. Each square of dark earth looks darker and lo lovelier like the summer night itself as you take away the weeds and you order and you order the world so that it is beautiful. It is Cleopatra or Helen of Troy. It is Elizabeth Taylor or Kim Bassinger. And you walk out each morning after the weeding when it is cool and dew is like Tom Cruise or John Cusack's eyes. You walk in the garden with your cup of coffee, black as the hair of those beautiful boys. And your newly weeded garden is those beautiful women who never face death, or a sink full of unwashed dishes, or jobs they hate, or lovers who are impotent or bored by sex. But this year, I no longer find weeding the satisfying act that I know it can be. Perhaps the vegetation is so lush, that there are more weeds than planted things? Or is it that I get older and am reluctant to cut anything so full of life, so growing and burgeoning, though crushing the mosquitoes gives me not a qualm? Am I fat or tired or lazy, or is my garden different this year? These almost bouquets of mint flowers floating tall outside my window. The millennium is coming, and the Washington Post tells me we have all the technology and resources we need to clean up our air if we'd spend the money to do it. Did I take the wrong turning, as Jeffers thinks that all the human species did? I mean a different, personal, wrong turning so that this summer I can no longer order my life, clean it up, make it as perfect as a movie by weeding. Am I no longer Rapunzel, my long hair gone, now her keeper, the old witch, hacking off the rope of hair so no prince could ever again climb it, looking from my tower at the delicious arugula in the garden, overtaken by wild growth, and not even willing or interested in weeding it out. Uh, the publisher of a, a small magazine uh, who is uh, publishing a section of these poems um, under the title Coiling Light and uh, was giving credit to the title of my new book, Medea the Sorceress, said to me, wow, what an interesting pun just occurred to me, Med media because M-E-D-E-A, M-E-D-I, media, the sorceress in our time. And I thought, oh, I have to see if I can't write a poem with that title. <laughs> so this is what I wrote. This is called Media, the New Sorceress. And of course, it's dedicated to Robert Creeley, who else? The muse. How I have bragged all these years that I do not read newspapers or watch television. How I have opened my hands filled with moonlight and found only human palms which stretch into winter on the desert. But I am still the California girl who grew up thinking life was the movies. My neighbors in Michigan make their cactus bloom. But even when I drive through America looking for hawks on fence posts and the flowers of prickly pear and barrel cactus, teddy bear choya or ocotilla, I find only myself. Always thinking of the one man for whom I gave up everything, my Jason, who laughed at me when he left me for another woman, saying I had misunderstood why he loved me, that he only needed my magic, that that other goddess, that slim-footed one, had made me love him so much that nothing else mattered. I was blinded with love. These thick lenses which have always covered my eyes they have hidden the real story from me, but given me the power to see something every Hollywood fan could tell you is obvious, that we are the roles we play. We become the words we speak. 
Oh, silence. Silence, or is it only white noise? Steel man pumps iron, and I guess I pump light. Do I dream of Tom Cruise in Top Gun, or Scott Glenn in Silverado, or John Cusack in The Sure Thing? I mean really dream when I am asleep and try to forget about old age and death. Or do the movements under my eyelids, like sand rippling on the Mojave Desert, mean that I have turned into words on printed pages on which come or which come on those waves which are sound rather than light? And like Medea escaping, escaping in her chariot drawn by dragons, do I learn that no magic is powerful enough to keep us from falling, failing at love? No magic can rescue any lover from betrayal. We can leave behind everything we love. And in doing so, we leave behind a story. The end of the story is not death. It is escape. Beyond the story is life, which we live unlike stories which happen to us and only in retrospect do we tell or live while we sleep. Of course, when Orpheus looks back, Eurydice is not there, of course. Sorcery is, the, is only the diurnal movement. Night must become day. Each morning with the light I open my book and pour the steaming cup of coffee and begin to feed myself with words, the ones which might carry me beyond the body's betrayals. Words, oh words, where are you leading me now? I'd like to finish with a short group of three poems that um, I guess answer the question of where are you leading me now. I suppose one of the things that middle-aged people do and older people do is get interested in the young. I suppose that's why I watch teenage movies. And uh, we get interested in our children. And uh, if you have a profession such as mine, which is teaching, we get very interested in our students. And if you're a poet, as I am, we get very interested in the young poets who will um, begin to carry on the tradition that we feel that we've been carrying on. And uh, uh, this has been a particularly rich term for me to teach a group of undergraduates at Michigan State University who are so different and so interesting. And I think I started thinking of them as uh, if they were characters in one of those teenage movies that I watch so raptly on my video VCR. Uh, this first poem is called House of Cards. And it describes some of the boys who are in this uh, undergraduate class that I have. The tall guy who wears the cowboy hat and whose jeans are always ripped enough to make you aware of his skin the one whose eyes are like pansies, the macho guy who says he's not very smart but that he loves poetry. Walking down the hall in front of me as I head for the ladies, he for the snack machine where he always gets a pint of milk, tall. I find I love to talk to him, fall into those eyes as if they are jeweler's boxes which could hold enough poems to change civilization if poetry changed anything. His eyes are so different from the dark bicycle rider with gray eyes, who looks and looks without ever blink blinking, reads in a monotone, stares as if a destiny, and is simply filled to the roots of himself with the desire to be heard. There are so many of them who gather in that room with me as we worship the elegance of an idea or a turn of phrase. The young man who wears the long tweed coat and writes sonnets better than mine ever were and the thin one who boldly says he'd like to be Lord Byron, while in fact holding behind his quiet, almost frozen eyes, nothing but almost pure intelligence. Opposites, the attraction, I suppose. I who gave up motherhood, some Thursdays when I look at these young men am filled with a strange sense of family pride. Imagined sons and lovers, what a bunch of kings and jacks, what a hand, what aces they are. Some rewards come late and are so diffused no one but the winner knows that there has been a state gambled. Think of that on Thursday afternoons as I pick up my cards, 
never less than a full house, and often, as I have never had in poker, a royal flush. <laughs> And this one is called Full Moon Eyes. It isn't that I didn't want to like you. I always wanted to like you, because in your cowboy hat and torn jeans, and with your very polite, almost cowboy polite manners to me, yes ma'am, you were likable. But I didn't want to feel the way I do, that those eyes, which are almost like girls' eyes, like flowers, like horses' eyes, maybe, as seen by Jim Wright, which looked straight at me with such belladonna innocence, no macho challenge or even that kind of cool or contained gaze I expect from handsome men. I didn't want to feel as if I could fall into them, as into a well or an abandoned mine shaft and be lost. It's not love. It's definitely not what I feel for my husband or what I felt for my first lover or the motorcycle betrayer or for any man I can think of that strangely long procession through my life. It is not what I would feel either if I were your mother, something I cannot even imagine. Sometimes I think when you walk into the room that it is an actor playing the part of someone with your name and I realize I have no idea if you exist, but then you say something and I look up into those eyes, yes, as if I were looking up at some racehorse, such a different piece of flesh than I am. And as Whitman says he could turn and be with animals, and as he too thinks particularly of the thoroughbred stallion, I don't find myself mesmerized either. Just standing there rather like Whitman, I think, admiring something, being drawn into it, and then instantly imagining myself exhilarated with its speed, which becomes my own. What I didn't want to accept is that I think about your full moon eyes all the time, even now, as I sit here in the dark and without knowing anything about your life. I don't want to feel this, watching for the morning light as the tangled bare branches of winter lace themselves against the shadowed, but still dark early morning sky. And the last poem is called Red Silk Scar. Wearing his long coat, he walks into the room. I expect that he will be carrying a skateboard, but he is not. I know that this magician must have in his pocket silk scarves which with long fingers he will pull and pull out and out. No silliness like white rabbits or the accoutrements of aristocracy, black top hat, morning coat, or tails. I know he wouldn't be cruel enough to carry snakes in his pockets, but I know that he controls me with his hands, which know how to touch lightly anything. A stone and a drop of water will appear. My desk and a small green frog will be sitting there. The cardinal red scarf which he draws out of his pocket and convinces me it must have my name on it. There is nothing I can say, though my lips ought to be able to ask him why he doesn't love women so well as men. I could never ask this question of any man, which is why I write it down and write it down with my red-inked pen as if I am being punished for a schoolgirl failure. You have to look far back into the past to find women as sorcerers, and even then they have often been rewritten into false beauty, their snaky heads covered and disguised, their talon hands sheathed with silk and jewels. This young man walks by me in his long wool coat and engaging smile. I smile back. Maybe he already knows we are both magicians. Maybe he doesn't, but that is what I am here to teach him. <laughs>